Whenever we're going to create anything in Spark AR, it's always important to start doing some conceptualization and ideation first. Now we've done that stage and we've done it on paper, we're now going to have to go to the stage of starting to digitize this. So this is where we need to start considering how we're going to generate our assets. Now it's quite easy for you to sort of say, oh, let's just go online and do a Google search and just copy and paste some stuff. However, if we want to create bespoke assets that are actually not going to infringe copyright issues, we need to use some form of photo or drawing package. So I'm going to be using Illustrator. However, you could use something like GIMP or any other program that you feel comfortable with that you've got access to at the time. And I'm just basically going to take my drawing that I've done on paper and start to digitize it. So the first thing I tend to do is I tend to look for research. I tend to do some research uh, look, especially if it's a real object, for example, in this case, a valve or pipe or dial. And I'll look for some reference images, find an image that sort of looks kind of the idea of what I want. And then I'll start to recreate it in my drawing package. So whenever we're working with things with variable screen sizes, we tend to try and, where possible, work with vectors. Now, vectors allow us to scale the object or image indefinitely without pixelation happening. Uh, we try and avoid rasters where possible because, obviously, pixelation and quality degrades depending on the screen resolution, and we can't tell what the end user's screen size would be. So, for example, I kind of roughly um, it working to a rough dimensions of, let's say, 720p wide. So on paper, when I was doing my ide ideation and uh, sort of thinking stage, essentially, I was thinking how much uh, screen real estate is this image or part going to take up? So by knowing the sort of percentage of how much this image is going to take up as part of the greater whole, I also then need to consider how large it needs to be in terms of does it have any interactions? Are those interactions going to be clear to the end user? If they are, if they are, for example, tapping on something, would it be big enough for the user to be able to easily tap on it, depending on if they've got a small screen size, for example? And then also, obviously, things like high, uh, layer hierarchy. Is that asset going to be on top of another asset? Could that cause some occlusion or interaction issues? Is that asset going to be animated? If it's going to be animated, is it going to be animated as a whole or is it going to be animated in component parts? If it's going to be animated in component parts, I then need to think in terms of how I'm going to create those assets in different layers. So I tend to try and keep my assets in different layers as much as possible, so I've always got room in there to rearrange and adjust things later. Also, with naming things so I can also obviously come back to it later and work out what it is I've done. So it's all about working efficiently and trying to keep streamlined and optimising where possible. Now, at the moment, at this stage, I'm not too worried about the actual scale of my assets because I'm working with vectors. If you was working with rasters, though, you would need to try and keep to a set dimensional scale. So each of these assets I'm going to spend some time on, as you can see. Um, this obviously would take a lot longer and you're not going to see the whole process of me creating all the assets for this effect. Um, but once all these assets are created, I'm then going to uh, go to export these. So in Illustrator, I'm just going to go to export selection uh, to export each individual area individually, give them an appropriate name, and then I'm going to give them a pixel height or width that is going to be proportionate to the average phone size screen and how much real estate of that screen it's going to take up. Now, because although I'm working with vectors, I should be able to scale indefinitely. Spark AR will start to degrade the visual quality once it's imported, so trying to get it as close as I can at this stage is in my best interest. So if I've got any assets that are going to be animated, I need to consider how I'm going to have them animated. So if there's going to be animated within Spark AR, we're fine and we can look at that in the next video. But if we are looking at animating things within an animation program such as Adobe After Effects or Flash or any or any or number of video editing programs out there, we need to consider how we're going to export these frames and also how those animations are going to be played out over what time. So we, if we're working with animations, we need to keep the number of frames as minimal as possible. So I tend to always adjust the frame rate to be around 12 frames per second 
or half what you would expect for a traditional animation or video. And then I try and keep the video clip length to be as short as possible and remove any frames that are not needed. So this, the small frames you have to smooth with the animation, but for Spark we really want to keep our file sizes down. I'm also going to make these composition sizes to be fairly square because I'm going to be putting these on planes. So I want these to be fairly uh, proportionate one by one uh, within a square space so I can adjust the, it easier. Anything that's going to have a pivot point, if I can get it right within the After Effects stage or animation stage, life is easier. If not, I can always use null objects within Spark AR. And again, we'll look at that in a future video. So for now, I'm just going to animate these assets. And then once these are done, I'm going to go to File and export these as an image sequence. You could also use a photo editing program to create your sequence of images. You just need to make sure that each image is saved in a sequential naming convention. And if you want to keep transparency, you need to save them with alpha on in a PNG format. If you do not save your image with alpha, transparent, alpha and RGB on, you will be giving a default background in most programs, which is not ideal. If you're working with images that are going to be perfectly square and don't need transparency, then you can just save it as a JPEG sequence. And then once we've done all that, we're going to save these into a folder, making sure that we never work from a USB, that we save everything locally onto our machine and everything is named easier in the sense that when we pick this up, we'll be able to work out what we're doing. So any person that picks up your project would be able to deconstruct what is going on. Once we've done that, we're ready for the to start putting things into Spark. And in the next video, we'll be actually starting to import these assets into Spark, getting our layout set up as we expect, and then starting to do some basic animations in it. So remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and keep following this series to see the final effect be generated. All the uh, files for this project will be available to Patreon subscribers once this course ends. And I appreciate your comments down below and we'll adapt as we go along. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again soon.